psalmist says, give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. It's he who remembered us in our low estate and rescued us from our foes for his steadfast love endures forever. Well, we're going to sing a version of uh, Psalm 136 now. It's number 136 in our blue books. Give to our God immortal praise, mercy, and truth are all his ways. Wonders of grace to God belong. Repeat his mercies in your song. pray together. O God, our Father, how gladly we join our voices in praise to you, God of grace and mercy, who remembered us in the lostness of our sin and who rescued us from all our foes, even, even from the great foe of death itself, because your steadfast love, your has said, your covenant love endures forever, from eternity to eternity, from before the very foundation of this world until, as we've sung, long after 
suns and moons will shine no more and this whole earth will be flooded with the light of your glorious presence. I would rejoice that, that you, the God of gods, the God of heaven, are our God, our Father, who loves us, who keeps us. Even though you are the Father in heaven, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the one who made the starry skies, all, all the wonders that we see, so majestic is your greatness. And yet your surpassing wonder is that enduring mercy towards us, made known to us so fully, so completely in the person of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, our prayer together as your people <clears throat> is to make us worthy of you. To forgive us afresh our sins, which are so many, so, so self-multiplying. And to go on turning our hearts to you in righteousness. Turn us again to you, we pray, Lord, in in obedient faith and trust and love so that we might please you, so that we would bring delight to you and to your name and not, and not shame to your glorious name. And so, almighty and merciful God, look upon our infirmities with your mercy and in all our dangers and our necessities Stretch forth thy right hand to help and to defend us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, a very warm, warm welcome indeed to uh, all of you this morning. And a particular welcome if you're with us here at the Tron for the first time. Hope that you'll feel uh, very much at one with us here as uh, a fellowship of God's people and uh, we look forward to meeting you uh, at the close of the service. Can I draw your attention to these sheets you should have on your, on your seats? They contain all the, the uh, details about what's going on in the life of the church this week. If you look on the inside pages, you'll see uh, two columns full of all sorts of different things. You'll see uh, on Wednesday that our small group ministries start again after the Christmas break. And uh, if you're not in one of the, the small groups, either one of the groups that meets in homes or... Uh, or here in Bath Street, then please do uh, ask us about those. Uh, anybody can, can turn up on Wednesday at 7 for tea and coffee. A number of the groups meet here, so if that's easier for you, then you'd be very welcome to come along and join in. But uh, ask one of the stewards or one of the staff afterwards, and we'd be glad to give you, uh, to give you further information. You'll see there uh, down at the bottom uh, on Saturday, Rachel and Rory's wedding, so do be remembering them and pray for them. Uh, on Saturday and uh, on the back page there you'll see uh, we have a meeting next Sunday afternoon at five o'clock uh, about church membership. If you've been uh, with us for a time, if you want to consider this as being your church, when we're keen for folk to be uh, committed publicly, that's really just what, what church membership is about, it's about making that public commitment to stand with the Lord's people here, to serve with us and uh, we're always keen to encourage folk to do that. So if you'd like to know a little more about what that means in the fellowship here, come along next, next uh, Sunday at five, uh, and I'll be glad to, uh, to speak with you about it. There are other notices there. I'll let you, let you read those. Uh, do take note of the uh, insert. Uh, this year we're not having a, we're having a change. We're not having a, a calendar for our prayer partners, but every month uh, we're going to have this color insert so that you've got prayer updates uh, about our prayer partners and uh, then... You can also keep that, uh, that uh, page, stick it on your fridge or whatever it is, you'll notice it uh, and remember the Blythes and their work uh, in Istanbul and Turkey. Well, we're going to uh, come to our reading now this morning and we're resuming our studies after the break in the, uh, uh, in the, the book of Deuteronomy and uh, reading at Deuteronomy chapter 30. Uh, before we broke off for Christmas, we looked at chapter 29, and uh, 
That is the beginning, and chapter 30 concludes Moses' last great address. The third of his addresses, it's, a, it's, it's, like, a, it's like the book in miniature, really, chapter 29 and 30. It's the, the whole scope of what God's covenant gospel is all about. And so we read from chapter 30 at verse 1. It's page 172 in the, in the church Bibles. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I've set before you, and you call them to mind or call, call your heart to return among the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice and all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore, will return your fortunes and have compassion on you and will gather you from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. One of your outcasts is even in the uttermost part of heaven. From there, the Lord your God will gather you and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecute you. And you, you shall... Turn, literally turn and obey the voice of the Lord. And keep his commandments that I command you today. The Lord will God, your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your cattle and in the fruit of your ground. For the Lord will turn and take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers when you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in this book of the law. When you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. Neither is it afar off. It's not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandment of the Lord your God, then I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today, you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord your God swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Amen. May God bless to us. This is word. Well, there's a great deal there about God's mercy coming back to his people. And we're going to sing number 894, a hymn that reminds us that we remember God's great mercy and that it's by his help and his alone that we have safely come with him. Number 894, Carmo Fount of Every Blessing.
as the uh, musicians play quietly now, our offerings for the Lord's work are received. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, you have laid upon us as your church the responsibility of proclaiming to this world the light and the life of your glorious heaven and your kingdom through our Lord Jesus Christ to the uttermost parts of the earth and, and therefore this whole world and its peoples are to be in our minds and on our hearts and in our prayers. We thank you that you have given us so many that we are in direct partnership in your gospel throughout the world. And we do remember, especially at this time, the Blythes and their work in Istanbul and Turkey, thanking you for their great faithfulness there over so many years. And praying, Lord, in that land which in these days knows considerable convulsion and difficulty, both politically and on some of its borders, militarily. We do pray for them. We pray for the churches in that populous land, small in number and in the world's eyes, far from being strong. And yet, Lord, we know that where you are, there is might and there is power, even to the breaking down of the strongholds of faith and un, uh, of unbelief and of darkness. So we pray for the Blythe family, for all that they're involved in, for the land of Turkey. And we ask that your gospel would shine brightly in their great cities and in their towns. You would encourage those in ministry and those who are training for ministry and mission. And that you would give them courage to stand in the face of threat and of intimidation. And that they might see your church grow, even in the face of all of these things. We continue to pray too also, Lord, for our partners, the Gills in Pakistan. Thanking you so much for the encouragement that we've been able to be to Imran and Nagina through our Christmas offering. And we pray, Lord, that that would now enable them to become settled in a home that will uh, be adequate for their family requirements and would help them to have that as a base for ministry in the years to come without fear and without worry. We pray for Imran as he 
is currently in the United States and speaking at various meetings and pray that you would encourage him by them and give him safe travel next week back home to his family. We pray that you would use him greatly as you have been for the sake of the gospel of Christ in the land of Pakistan and among the many, many of his countrymen and women who so desperately need to hear the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God our Father. We think, Lord, of our own nation in these days where the enormous privileges that we have had over so many generations, indeed centuries, seem so increasingly to be being despised and marginalized and thrust aside as relics of a past that we want to forget. We think of the increasing concerns about the intrusion of the state, especially through the machinations of our parliament in Edinburgh, which seems so keen to make our country the most liberal and progressive, whatever that may mean. But in doing so, it risks eroding the very foundations of community and of society, that is, marriage and the family. So many attacks on that in recent months and years and more to come. We pray, Lord, for our parliamentarians. We pray for them to listen to the voices of their constituents. And so many of these things are very definitely against some of the policies being proposed. We pray for those who seek to bring truth and light to bear in the public discourse of our land, that they would be heard and not silenced, not intimidated by the increasing power, fearsome power of lobbyist groups that make people afraid to say what they think and express what they know deep down to be true and real. We pray for our parliament in Westminster with all the issues that they are dealing with in these days. And we pray that despite these things, they would not be distracted in areas which are of vital importance to our nation's health and future and all the generations to come. May they understand that there are things more important than pounds and euros and dollars, more important even than trade more important than so many of the things that seem to be all that our politicians talk about. Above all, Lord, we pray for your church in our own nation, in our cities and our towns and our villages. So much of the confusion, the darkness that is abroad in our society must be because the church of Jesus Christ has not spoken with clarity as you have called us to do, showing the way of light and truth and exposing the ways of darkness, of ill health, of that which is damaging to society. Help us, we pray, Lord, to be unashamed of your great gospel of truth, which is the way and the only way of life and of wholeness and of human happiness and flourishing. And of course, which is the path and the path alone of life that is everlasting and eternal. Help us, Lord, we pray as a congregation here in Glasgow in our various locations to see the opportunities that you have given us and to understand the responsibilities that you have put upon our shoulders to be what you've called the church to be, a pillar and buttress of truth in a decaying and dying world. Lord, may the message of our lips, but also the message and the influence of our lives speak the truth to our communities, our neighbors, our workplaces, our friends. May we be people whose lives so make an impact that our lips will be heard. 
not those whose words are drowned out by behavior, by standards, by lifestyles that simply contradict the things that we say that we believe and proclaim. Help us, Lord, we pray. We need your mercy. We need your strengthening day after day after day. And so we're gathered this morning once again around your word, saying, speak to us, Lord. Draw near to us. Descend with all your power as we meet, as we wait upon your word. Draw near to us. Inspire us. Give us hearts, we pray, to pray, to praise, and to love you. And to show this world the way that is the way of life, the way of truth, and the way of love to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, as we come to your word now, that is our prayer. Open our eyes that we may see wondrous things from this, your law. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing then, as we come to God's word, the prayer that we find in number 534 in our books. On this assembled host, uh, in this accepted hour, O Spirit, as at Pentecost, descend in all your power. Number 534. Let's turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. There's a lot of talk at the moment of uh, great speeches and oratory because of the film uh, The Darkest Hour about Winston Churchill. Apparently, uh, cinemas have been breaking into uh, standing ovations at these great wartime messages of uh, Churchill to the British nation. I've not seen it yet, but I look forward to seeing it. I'm sure perhaps some of you already have. It seems something of the impact of, uh, of this is because it's recognizing a quality of real leadership that is just so rare today in our Western world. 
But of course, after the fall of France in 1940, everyone in these islands was only too aware that Britain stood alone, facing a huge threat, a, an apparently unstoppable Nazi Germany. And the future that this nation faced was a very great abyss of great darkness, unless there was going to be an extraordinary uh, turnaround. And of course, Churchill's role was to galvanize the nation behind his leadership, to trust him, uh, so as to be able to avoid giving up and giving in to that impending doom and disaster. Well, I don't suppose anyone gave a standing ovation to Moses as he delivered his last passionate message to Israel on the plains of Moab there. But in a very real way, he was facing Israel with their darkest hour. Even before they set foot in the promised land, as we saw last time we looked at this in chapter 29, his message was, was deeply sobering. You might well be God's chosen people, he was saying, but do not overestimate yourselves. Your hard hearts can make you deaf and blind to God's truth in his gospel. And defiance and, and presumption that refuses to take your sins seriously and, and distraction from God's clear call to know and to do his will, it will lead you into darkness and into disaster if you don't pay heed. And Moses faces them, doesn't he, with the terrible reality of what it will mean to fall under the curse of God. Look at the end of chapter 29 again, just to remind ourselves. Verse 23, he says, if you do that, the whole land will be judged like Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 25, the people of the world will see it and they will say it is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord and served other gods. And so verse 27, God's own anger is unleashed upon his own people. Verse 28, he he uprooted them from their land in great anger and wrath. It's a terrifying prospect, isn't it? An unimaginable prospect for God's people Israel. But God says, don't overestimate yourselves. This is what I foresee because I know your hearts, says Moses, and God knows your hearts. And that is what will happen to you if you forget God's gracious revelation to you as a privileged people. And forget that, as the very last verse of chapter 29 says, God's word is for hearing and doing. Because as Jesus himself said, it's no good. It's no good calling me Lord, Lord, and not doing what I command you. Who are my true people? Who are my family? It's those who hear the word of God and do it. Who live out their love for me in obedient faith to me. In lives of living sacrifice. Not in disloyalty. And you see, if Moses' message ended at the end of chapter 29, my goodness, it would indeed be bleak. And not just for Israel then, but for all the rest of us today, because which of us, which of us can possibly be confident that our heart is any less perverse, that our hearts are less prone to wonder, as we just sang? But of course, thank God, his speech didn't end there. Because if the message of chapter 29 is don't overestimate yourselves and your righteousness, then the message of chapter 30 is emphatically just as strong. Don't ever underestimate God and his righteousness. Being great, made right with God again, even in the wake of great sin, great rebellion and rejection of him, so as to deserve nothing but his wrath, being made right with him again is not impossible. Because it's not about our merits, which are truly pitiful. It's all about God's mercy. And his mercy is truly plentiful. That's Moses' gospel. That's, that's the, <coughs> the covenant gospel of God. And that's the Bible's gospel from its beginning to end. Well, the Apostle Paul picks up Moses' words constantly in his great letter to the Romans. For God says to Moses, says Paul, it depends not on human will or exertion, but upon God who has mercy, Romans 9, verse 16. And he goes on in Romans 10 to quote Moses' very words from this chapter. 
And he says, this is the very same word of faith that we proclaim. Lay hold on God's mercy, he says, and you will be saved. You will be saved. Because nothing is impossible with God. And the Bible's clear from beginning to end. God is a God of justice, a God of judgment. But mercy triumphs even over judgment. C.S. Lewis has a marvelous phrase in his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where he speaks about the deeper magic from before the very dawn of time, which overcomes the, the deep magic from the dawn of time that demands that the sons of Adam must, uh, must be put to death if they sell themselves into the hands of the evil power of the white witch. But there's a deeper magic. And that's what this chapter is revealing to us. Moses presupposes, doesn't he, God's judgment upon his people's sin. But he proclaims life. He proclaims restoration through repentance, but granted by the sheer grace and mercy of God. Grace and mercy that Paul tells us was purposed even before the very foundation of this world. So it's a great chapter of hope, of great gospel hope. Moses and Paul and Jesus, all they speak with one voice. And it is the voice of absolute realism. Yes, we must never overestimate ourselves. The human heart is at best utterly frail. And at worst, it's utterly foolish. It's utterly filthy. Isn't that true? But praise God, the future depends not upon human will and exertion, but upon God who has mercy. So never underestimate God. This chapter echoes Moses' words right back. You may remember at the end of chapter 4, where likewise he speaks about that calamity of exile that would come upon them. And yet even there, he promises that those who are truly his will return to his land and obey his voice. Because he says, the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will never leave you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant he made with your fathers. So let's look a bit more closely here in this chapter about how Moses tells us that that can be so, and especially in the face of human beings whose hearts are so rebellious and so hardened. Moses proclaims in this chapter a gospel of utter certainty and a gospel of unmistakable clarity and a gospel of urgent challenge. Look at verses 1 to 10, where we see that, you see, because the gospel of God is an enduring covenant word, there is utter certainty. Utter certainty, because it is God's sovereign regeneration and restoration of the heart. A powerful regeneration is promised that God will do it, says Moses. Not because people deserve it. Look at verse 3 but because God will have compassion on you. Great mercy. Notice how definite, how certain it all is. It's in verse 1, when all these, happen, these things happen. Not if. Moses is presupposing God's judgment on their sin. There's no question. They will be driven out. Verse 3, they will be scattered. And they deserve to be, utterly, because they've violated God's covenant. They've rejected him. They've rejected his love. And yet look at verse 3. Then the Lord your God will restore you to abundant blessings, even more blessings than their fathers. God will do it. It's utterly certain. He will turn back to them, but not notice, not notice, without them also turning back to him. Do you see that? There's nothing uncertain about it, but nor is there anything unconditional about it. That's something these verses make absolutely clear, as does the whole Bible. God's sovereign regeneration and restoration and our repentance, they always go together like two sides of the same coin. So it's not uncertain. God will do all this. Look at verses 3 to 7, all that God will do. It's one great unbroken sequence. God will restore and gather his people, verse 3. Verse 4, even from the farthest outposts of heaven, and he'll bring them back, verse 5. 
and prosper them more than their fathers. He will circumcise their hearts and make them love him with heart and soul. Verse 6. That's the foundational call, isn't it, of the covenant, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. And verse 7, he will curse every enemy and foe. It is not uncertain because it's God who will do all of this. But notice it's not unconditional. They will repent. They must return to God, even as God will return to them. All through verses 1 to 10 here, there's a great play on that verb, to turn, to repent. And it, God does it and human beings do it. So in verses 1 and 2 there, as I read, it, it's literally when you, when you call to mind, when you return in your heart to God's covenant. And verse 2, when you return to the Lord, then verse 3, the Lord will restore, literally return your fortunes. You see? The same in verses 9 and 10. Verse 10, when you obey the voice of the Lord your God, when you turn to the Lord with heart and soul, then, as verse 9 says, the Lord will again delight. The Lord will literally turn and take delight in you. And the challenge of verse 8 is the same. It's, it's really better rendered as a command, as a challenge. Today, Moses is addressing his hearers. As for you, today, you shall turn and obey the voice of the Lord your God. See, Moses is declaring a gospel of utter certainty, of a God who is sovereign, who alone can bring about that powerful regeneration of the human heart, who alone can give a certain promise of eternal life. But to turn from rebellion and to turn towards the living God is the only way that that life can ever be imparted to human beings in every age, Moses' day, Jesus' day, and in our day. The gospel of God is not uncertain. He is the sovereign God. But it is certainly not unconditional. We must submit to the sovereign God. So Derek Kidner is right to say that the curses which outweighed the blessings in chapter 28, we see in this passage, uh, shows grace superabundant where sin abounded. Praise God for his superabundant grace. But you see, God's grace is never cheap grace. When grace reigns, as Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 6, there, there will be obedience in the heart to God. Because we're no longer slaves to sin, but in slavery to God's righteousness. That's what real repentance, real returning to God is all about, isn't it? And it is the inseparable fruit of God's regenerating the human heart. And that's the true biblical gospel, always, always. It is simultaneously a proclamation of God's grace and a summons to repentance. It proclaims the turning of God back towards sinners, but it demands the turning of sinners back towards God. But God promises what he commands. What is the great commandment according to the Lord Jesus himself? Well, it's what the second half of verse 6 here expresses, isn't it? Loving the Lord with all your heart and soul so that you might live. But that is the fruit, isn't it, only of the first half of verse 6, of the Lord circumcising your heart so that you will love the Lord with heart and soul and live. God grants repentance as he commands it. Because the gospel is, says Paul, the power of God for salvation. It is certain, but it's not unconditional. It's for everyone who believes who turn to him in obedient faith. Now, of course, Moses is principally talking here to Israel as a whole. He's talking about the coming historical reality of the exile as it ultimately happened in Babylon. And in those dark days, the prophets like uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and so on, they picked up these very promises, didn't they? They proclaimed them again to God's people, promising the certainty of God's ultimate turning back and gathering all his people once again under his shepherd care. Indeed, multiplying them with, with people of every nation, just as God had promised right at the beginning to Abraham. 
a certain future, never again to be spoiled, an everlasting covenant, never to be revoked. Read the end of Ezekiel's prophecy, and you'll see he envisages that returning of the Lord to the midst of his people, to Zion. The Lord living in his great city forever, right in the midst. What will the city be called? Last verse of Ezekiel. The Lord is there. He's seeing the same ultimate zenith of glory that the Apostle John sees in his vision in Revelation. The great city coming down out of heaven to earth full of the glory and the praise of all the nations. And of course, when the Lord Jesus came at last, he was proclaiming the beginning of that very return of the Lord to redeem, to restore his people. That's what John the Baptist's father saw, isn't it, in those readings that we read at Christmas in his great song at the beginning of Luke's gospel. God has visited. He has redeemed his people to show the mercy promised to our fathers, to give salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God. Certainty because of God's sovereign mercy. A powerful regeneration is promised. God will do it. He has returned. He's turned towards his people in abundant mercy and grace. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was Jesus' very first words in his public ministry. It's begun. There's nothing uncertain. It is a work of God's sovereign grace. But it's not unconditional, isn't it? What were Jesus' very next words? The kingdom of God is at hand, therefore repent and believe the gospel. God is turning to you in his sovereign mercy. So you must turn to him and bow to his sovereign majesty. And just like like Moses, Jesus' call was, yes, to Israel as a whole, to the whole nation. He was summonsing the people once again to turn to God. But at the same time, he gave that very same message, didn't he, to every single individual that he spoke to. You must repent. You must obey the Lord your God from your heart. That was his message, even to the most religious, even to the most upright, the most pious of people. Just like Moses here, you see there's no cheap grace in the gospel. But there is deep grace. Deep, deep grace. None are too far away ever to be brought back into the love of his everlasting life. Isn't that what Jesus showed so wonderfully in his ministry? Think of his words to the tax collectors, to the outcasts, to the sinners of the very worst kind. These are the very ones I came to seek and save. He said, not the sick who need the doctor. It's not the well who need a doctor, but the sick. I came to call sinners to repentance, the outcasts, the faraway ones. Think of the parable of the the invitation to the great banquet when the master sends his servants out to bring in the poor, the crippled, the halt, the lame. Go into the highways and the byways as far away as you can and compel them to come in for my house will be full. He's telling us, isn't he, that none are too far away to ever be brought back to the abundant blessing of his life. Isn't that what verse 4 here is telling us too, right in front of us? The authorized version puts it rightly in the singular. If any one of your outcasts is banished, even to the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather and bring you and cause you to love him so that you may live. No one, not even those who have been furthest banished away from God because of their sin and their rebellion and their hatred of him, no one, is too far away to be brought back into the life of God. And Moses says, that is utterly certain. Because it's not about what we deserve. If it were, none of us could have any hope. It's not about our merits. It's all about God's great mercy. And how much more certain can we be today of that great promise of mercy because we live in the light of that great fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ who came to bring us forgiveness 
who bore away our sins in his own body on the tree, as Peter puts it, so that we might return to the great shepherd of our souls. We have a risen Savior, and Peter preaches that, doesn't he? God has exalted him as leader and Savior. To do what? To grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And a bit later on, he says, God also has granted repentance and life even to Gentiles, which most of us are. Because the gospel is God's enduring covenant word, we can have utter certainty in his sovereign regeneration of the heart. And no one can ever be beyond that reach or power or mercy, even in the uttermost parts of the earth. That should give great encouragement to us, shouldn't it? Especially if we might feel ourselves, oh, well, my life has been so far away that I must be beyond the mercy and the power of God. No, no. Or some of us who feel, well, there are people we know and love, and they're just too far gone. They will never repent. They could never come to the Lord Jesus Christ. No, our sovereign God can, and he does restore, even from the uttermost reaches of heaven and earth. It's right in front of us. And it's certain. And Jesus tells us, doesn't he, when he does do that, there is unbridled joy among the angels of heaven in the Father's house. So let's never give up on calling people to turn to the Lord. And let's never stop crying out to God to turn his face towards us, to turn our hearts constantly back to him so that we might love him with all our heart and our soul and others with us. And... Let's never try to pretend that what God asks of us or of others in turning to him is somehow something that's beyond us. Look at verses 11 to 14, where Moses tells us plainly that because the gospel of God is his enduring covenant word, we have unmistakable clarity. We have God's sufficient revelation to our hearts. We have plentiful personal revelation so that we can do what he commands us. Often people say that, don't they? They say, oh, I can't do that. What your gospel demands with I understand it, to be right with God, I can't do it. It's impossible. It's too hard for me. You don't know. Or they say, well, I I wish I could understand and have your faith, but I just don't. I, I can't see. I don't get it. Well, that's not true. Look at verse 11, says God. What I command you today is not too hard for you. Neither is it far off, so there can be no excuses. It's not unintelligible, and it's not inaccessible. And verse 14, he says again, the word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart, so that you can do it. You can do it. See, what Moses is saying, even way back then in the Old Testament, is that God's gospel covenant can be kept by human beings. Because it's not about legalistic perfectionism and rules. It's about loving passion for the ruler. We've seen that again and again all through Deuteronomy. There is no book in the Old Testament that has more about the heart. And that's what God's covenant gospel has been about since the very beginning. The commandment that verse 11 speaks about here is the whole covenant revelation, the whole gospel with all its promises and all its demands. Remember back in chapter 6 at Sinai, God said, and this is the commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, and this is what's to be on your heart. It's a matter of the heart. There's nothing legalistic about it at all. That's why the Lord Jesus uses exactly the same kind of language all the way through his own gospel. In fact, Jesus' own final public message in John chapter 12 He cries out with passion in exactly the same way. He's urging people to believe and obey the commandment that God has given him. My father has given me a commandment, he says, to give to you. And his commandment is eternal life. Because it's the command to trust him, to love him with all your heart and soul. That's what Moses is urging here. Look at verse 6. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 
at 20. Love him. That's why Paul quotes these very words in these verses in 11 to 15 in Romans chapter 10. And he says, this sufficient revelation is the word of faith that we are proclaiming as apostles of Christ. And his point is that now in the fulfillment of all the covenant promises in Christ, this word is sufficient and has gone out to the whole world. <clears throat> it's come near to all the nations. So that everyone, he says, everyone all the world over who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God's saving gospel is no longer inaccessible to anybody. It's not impossible for any, from any nation, from any creed, for any culture to find salvation in Jesus Christ. But that salvation has been accessible and possible right from the very beginning to all those to whom God has revealed himself. <clears throat> that was the privilege Israel had in these early days over all the Gentile nations. Paul says in Romans 9, they have the covenants, they had the law, they had the patriarchs, they had the prophets, all of that. They had plentiful, sufficient revelation to their very hearts so they could be doers of the word of God, not just hearers. So that they could have love and loyalty to God in their hearts and be saved. Moses gave them, Paul says, a law that would lead to righteousness. It was they who resisted that. They did not pursue it by faith, he says. They did not submit. They did not obey the gospel. Was that God's fault? It's funny, even some Christians, a lot of Christians seem to think that. They seem to think that God perversely gave a law that could never be attained because it was unattainable, because it was impossible. And so they were doomed to fail. No, 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 no. Look at verse 11. How plain is it? It is not too hard for you. God has brought his revelation near to us, he says in verse 14, so we can do it. Because it's not, and it never was, anything to do with legalistic merit. It was always to do with loyalty to God's mercy. It was never about sinless holiness. It was always about having submissive hearts to the Lordship of God. The psalmist understood that. Read the psalms. Read especially the long psalm, 119. It's full, isn't it, of clear confession of sinfulness, and yet at the same time, profession of faithfulness and obedience to God's covenant law. And that's just biblical faith. That's just obedient faith and faithful obedience. It's knowing that you are at the same time a sinner, and yet you can be right with God through obedient trust in his covenant word. The very last verse of Psalm 119 sums it up perfectly. Just listen. I have gone astray like a lost sheep, he says. I'm a sinner. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. I trust your promises and I obey your commandments. I'm your servant. You alone are my God. See, he gets what Moses was talking about, what Jesus is talking about, that God's commandment his covenant is eternal life. And he has brought it near to us so that we might find life, not so that we won't find it. That's Moses' gospel, even way, way back here. His plea is you can do it, you can have it. You can have life if you will obey the call of God. If you don't take, if you don't take Moses seriously here, you are going to misunderstand the whole of the Bible. Chris Wright is absolutely on the money when he says this. The idea that God made the law so deliberately exacting that nobody would ever be able to live by it, that belongs to a distorted theology that tries unnecessarily to gild the gospel by denigrating the law. No, no, no. Look at what Moses' message is. It's not, you can't do it. It's the opposite. You can do it. You can find life with your God because he has brought his commandment of life near, so near, right into the heart of your lives in sufficient, plentiful, powerful revelation which mediates God's powerful, transforming mercy from heaven into your very heart so that the very thing which can only be the fruit of God's mercy, 
a real heart of love and loyalty to God so that it becomes something you can do in response to his word. Because his grace brings you into submission, into obedient trust in him as your Lord and God. You can do it, says Moses. God makes his promises to enable you to respond to him. And of course, that means, doesn't it, you can't ever blame God if you are the one who refuses to respond. And again, how much more true is that for us to whom God's revelation has been even more abundant and complete and sufficient? His word has come so near in God himself taking human flesh and coming among us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So no one can say, oh, I've searched high and low for God. I've searched everywhere. I can't find it. No, says Jesus. Whoever has seen me and heard me has seen and heard the Father. And no one can say, oh, I can't do that. As Jesus has said, come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. See, friends, the truth is not over the sea somewhere in some strange philosophy and religion. It's not up in heaven among elite, erudite professors and philosophers and holy men. No, no, no. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory in the gospel of the Son. God's gospel grace came near in the law of Moses, but the fullness of His gospel grace has come to all in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can know God, so we can find life. In his enduring covenant word is unmistakable clarity so that we can find him, so that we can follow him, so that we can have life. And we can never blame God if we refuse and determine to remain in darkness because we will have actively rejected his command to life. We will have actively chosen his sovereign curse. And that's what Moses makes clear, isn't it, in this final section in verses 15 to 20, where he insists that, that for all God is sovereign and for all his revelation is sufficient, precisely because his gospel is a sovereign word, it always issues to human beings an urgent challenge. It demands a sincere response from our hearts. A personal response is required of us. God says you can do it, and therefore you must do it. See, I have set before you, verse 15 today, life and good, death and evil. Verse 19, life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. It is a matter, he says, of life and death. And that is the choice in front of us here, isn't it? It's the choice that is there all the way through the Bible, from Moses and Joshua to Jesus and John. And it's an unavoidably binary choice, isn't it? Nothing blurred. Nothing indistinct. Nothing remotely relative. It's life and death, blessing and curse, heaven and hell. Of course, Moses is looking into the future. He's seeing the whole story of God's people as a whole. But do you notice that also in every section that we've looked at today, he is very clearly addressing and exhorting that generation, those people, that day who are standing right in front of him. He's not just talking about big picture biblical theology. He is speaking a personal word to everyone who is listening. And he is calling them with an urgent challenge to respond today. Verse 8, as for you, you are to obey today. Verse 11, this command, I command you today. And above all in this last section, again and again, verse 15. See, I'm setting before you today life and death. Verse 16, if you obey today. Verse 18, I declare to you today. Verse 19, I call heaven and earth as witness against you today. You see, it's true. <clears throat> God's story is, of course, bigger than any generation in any age. His purpose is everlasting. It is eternal. 
seen in that perspective, each one of our lives is just but a speck of dust in the scheme of his great plan. But doesn't Jesus tell us also that that great and mighty God is the God who numbers the very hairs of each one of our heads? Isn't he the one who knows every single one of his sheep by name? And his gospel does make an urgent plea, doesn't it, to every single individual hearer. And he presents every single one in every age with this urgent choice. Choose life. Something I think that highlights that all the way through this chapter is that where you read the word you, it is nearly always in the singular. I mentioned that in verse 4. If any one of your outcasts is far away. But it's all through. If you have an old version, it's thee and thou. It's not you and ye. Only in verse 18 where he gives that general warning in the plural. But every other plea here is personal. It's to each one of you personally. You, my friend, each one of you, choose life. Choose what he promises. Choose what he offers. You turn to him. Don't turn away from him. You see, the challenge of the biblical gospel is not impersonal. It's deeply personal to every individual because God cares for everyone who is outcast because of their sin. That's what Jesus makes so clear, isn't it, in the parable of the lost sheep. A 99 good sheep in the flock is not enough if even one individual lost outcast of his is out there. His gospel call is personal to us. And it's a personal call, isn't it, to him, to personal commitment to him. It's not a call to religion. It's not a call to ideas. It's not a call to performance. Look at verse 16. How do you obey him? By loving him, by walking with him in his way. Verse 20, finding life is, is, is loving the Lord. It's listening to the Lord. It's being loyal to the Lord, cleaving to him. That's real faith for the Bible, isn't it? That's, sometimes people say, what is faith? There it is. It's personally loving, listening, and being loyal to the Lord our God, made known to us most fully in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who has the Son has life, says the Apostle John. That's what Moses is saying here in verse 20. He is your life. He is your life. The challenge of the gospel is not impersonal to things or to thoughts. It's personal. It's to us and it's to each of us to be with him. And therefore, you see, the challenge is not avoidable. Sometimes people think, oh, if, if God is sovereign, how can there really be a choice? But you see, in fact, the Bible makes it clear that it's precisely God's sovereignty that demands a choice. There can't be impartiality when the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth demands that you choose his life. We can't just say, oh, well, no, Lord, I think I'll sit on the fence. To, to not obey, to not choose life is to choose defiance and disloyalty. Paul says in Acts chapter 17, doesn't he, to some of the cleverest men in the world in Athens, that the times of ignorance, and he means your ignorance, God in the past overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has set a day for judgment, and the Lord Jesus Christ will be the judge. There is no avoidance. Choice is unavoidable. Derek Kidner's right. He says, life and good are man's to choose. Never to earn, but to choose. It's a command of the sovereign God. And yet it is an offer of sheer grace. So that to refuse that call of grace is to spit in the face of the God who so loved this world, he gave his own blood that we might choose life. And none can so profane the blood of the covenant, so outrage the spirit of grace, and not, in doing so, thereby exclude themselves from that life that they have treated with such contempt. 
But notice one final thing that's so, so clear here. The challenge of the gospel is not impersonal, nor is it avoidable, but the challenge of God's gospel is not dispassionate. Moses cares what his people choose, and God cares what people choose. He sets before them the truth that is absolutely clear, absolutely certain, deeply challenging. He's hidden nothing. He's set before them life and death, blessing and curse, heaven and hell. But he does not say, not here, not anywhere in the whole scriptures. I've put it before you. Do as you please. See if I care. Take it or leave it. Never. What does he say? Choose life, says Moses. Enter by the narrow gate, cries Jesus. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, says the Lord God, and not rather that they turn from their ways and live? No. No. God, our Savior, says the Apostle Paul, desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So never underestimate God. He says to you personally, each one of you today, each one of us here in this room, choose life. None can be too far away. He promises powerful regeneration of your heart, powerful restoration through Jesus Christ. He has given every single one of us here this morning plentiful revelation in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he does demand from every single one of us a personal response to the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, his mercy, his sovereign mercy calls us. And he says, choose. Choose life. Let's pray. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, so that you can do it. And this, says Paul, is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Grant us hearts, Lord, to turn to you. Today and every day we pray and to know your great mercy now and forever. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a hymn of response. It's on the screens. Today your mercy calls us to wash away our sin, however great our trespass. Wherever we've been, however long from mercy our hearts have turned away, your blood, O oh Christ, can cleanse us and set us free today. It is certain.
And so may that mercy and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the near fellowship of his Holy Spirit be yours today and always. Amen.